en colaboración con la Infraestructura Mundial de Información en Biodiversidad, GEBIF, por sus siglas en inglés, desarrollaron para el manejo de datos de biodiversidad basados en eventos. Esto es lo que voy a cubrir. Comencemos. El Atlas de Biodiversidad de Australia es la base de datos e infraestructura digital de biodiversidad que consolida registros de especies de plantas, animales y otros reinos taxonómicos en Australia. El Atlas provee acceso confiable a datos y servicios de biodiversidad para investigadores, industria y gobierno en Australia. La presentación se enfoca en nuevos tipos de datos y los sistemas informáticos que los soportan. El Atlas actualmente contiene más de 113 millones de registros de observación de especies. Un registro de especie captura información básica acerca de qué organismo fue visto en un lugar y tiempo específicos. La base de datos de registro de especies ha sido y continúa siendo el recurso de información más importante del Atlas. ¿Cuál es el problema que buscamos resolver? Los registros de especies son obtenidos desde diferentes fuentes colecciones, agencias de gobierno, ciencia ciudadana. Esto puede complicar las cosas. Por ejemplo, para tener un conjunto de registros comparables, misma metodología, mismo esfuerzo o mismas condiciones para mencionar algunos, o determinar la confiabilidad de un registro como su ubicación o evidencia. Mencioné ausencia de especies. El modelo basado en registro de especies nos ha ayudado y seguiremos contando con él, pero hay un límite en los tipos de preguntas que puede responder. El primer paso para permitir la creación de modelos estadísticos más complejos consiste en expandir nuestro modelo de datos, incluyendo eventos, y adicionalmente representar ausencia de especies de una mejor forma. Al representar eventos, ya no tendremos registros de especies de forma aislada. Así es como comenzamos el modelo extendido de datos del Atlas en enero de este año. A lo que nos referimos en este proyecto por datos extendidos es Datos de biodiversidad basados en eventos o actividades, por ejemplo, estudios ecológicos, expediciones, transectos, bioblitzes. Los estándares Darwin Core se refieren a estas actividades como eventos. Este es el término que usaré en el resto de la presentación. Hemos desarrollado este trabajo en colaboración con Heavy. Trabajamos juntos previamente en la implementación de pipelines en el Atlas, que fue un éxito podemos seguir tomando ventaja de la experiencia combinada de ambas organizaciones. Heavis continúa trabajando en el modelo de datos diversificado que busca resolver un problema similar, expandir su modelo de datos más allá de solamente registros de especies. Heavis ya había tomado el liderazgo y desarrollado una interfaz de usuario con tecnologías actuales. Finalmente, nos interesaba conservar consistencia en las interpretaciones. Contribuir al código base de pipelines de HEBIF en lugar de agregar solo extensiones específicas para el Atlas. ¿A qué nos referimos con camino práctico? Lo que hicimos puede ser resumido en dos elementos principales. Un modelo de datos alrededor de eventos y un sistema de punta a punta que soporta dicho modelo. Vayamos al modelo de datos. Construimos un modelo simple pero poderoso tomando como base Darwin Core, pero usando eventos como la entidad central. Podemos representar eventos en una jerarquía y relacionar registros de especies a eventos. Para el manejo del término Measurement and Facts, asociados a eventos o registros de especies, usamos las extensiones EMDATA desarrolladas por el Sistema de Información de Biodiversidad de Océanos, OBIS por sus siglas en inglés. Al capturar el método asociado para realizar una actividad, podemos tener una mejor representación de ausencia de especies. Hemos propuesto extensiones al estándar de Darwin Core. Desarrollamos un vocabulario representando tipos de eventos como expediciones o muestreos. También agregamos un término para el nombre de eventos. Preparamos una guía paso a paso y scripts que permiten a los proveedores de datos crear archivos Darwin Core con la información de eventos. Estos archivos contienen los conjuntos de datos que son el punto de entrada para el sistema de eventos. Vayamos ahora al sistema de eventos. Nuestra visión original era agregar funcionalidad a nuestros sistemas actuales que manejan registros de especies. Sin embargo, BioCage Hub y BioCage Service han acumulado deuda técnica y no nos permitían seguir adelante. 
¿Qué fue lo que hicimos al respecto? No tocamos los sistemas de registro de especies que ahora aparecen abajo en este diagrama. Aún reutilizamos el código de pipelines agregando extensiones para el manejo de eventos. Sin embargo, configuramos un nuevo sistema de procesamiento usando Amazon EMR, la versión de Spark de Amazon. Usamos Elasticsearch en lugar de Solar para manejar el nuevo índice de eventos. Elasticsearch permite anidar objetos en su índice. Finalmente, adoptamos componentes de GraphQL y ReactJS desarrollados originalmente por Heavy. Además de las nuevas interpretaciones para eventos agregadas a Pipelines, desarrollamos una interfaz de usuario para eventos y un servicio para bajar los datos. El trabajo que desarrollamos no fue sencillo. Vale la pena hacer una reflexión. La lista no es exhaustiva, pero aquí comparto algunos de los puntos más relevantes. Apache Spark es un motor para procesamiento de datos a gran escala y es usado para la ejecución de pipelines. Sin embargo, Spark no es apropiado para navegar relaciones entre registros. Esta funcionalidad es necesaria para construir una jerarquía de eventos. Tuvimos que trabajar en nuestra propia implementación para el manejo de grafos y el uso de una biblioteca llamada GraphX para cubrir las limitantes de Spark. Con respecto a la interfaz de usuario, nuestro primer intento en el Atlas no fue exitoso, dado que los componentes tenían una alta dependencia con la infraestructura de Heavy. Trabajamos en una versión simplificada de los componentes de interfaz de usuario para sobrepasar este problema. Actualmente continuamos trabajando en desarrollar un sistema basado en conectores, donde la interfaz de usuario pueda funcionar independiente de si está hablando con el registry de Heavy o el collector del Atlas. Finalmente, para bajar datos, tuvimos que tomar caminos diferentes. Para Hevip, habilitar un servicio para bajar datos de eventos consistía en extender su infraestructura actual para registros de especies. Esta infraestructura está basada en HBase y Hive y maneja billones de registros en Hevip. Para nosotros en el Atlas, la complejidad de esta infraestructura no era justificable, dado que el volumen de datos que tenemos es una fracción de lo que Hevip maneja. En su lugar, usamos la infraestructura que ya tenemos basada en Amazon EMR. En resumen, el Atlas está expandiendo su modelo de datos. Estamos agregando soporte a la información de biodiversidad basada en eventos que permitan la creación de modelos estadísticos más complejos que no pueden ser creados únicamente con registros de especies. Trabajamos en colaboración con Heavy, tomando ventaja de nuestra experiencia combinada y alineando procesamiento tanto como es práctico. Creamos una solución punta a punta para el manejo de datos basados en eventos al extender pipelines, creando una interfaz de usuario y un servicio para bajar datos. Tuvimos retos como la limitante de Spark para manejar información jerárquica. Esto nos lleva al final de la sesión. Tanto Hevit como el Atlas reconocen las limitantes del modelo de datos actual y estamos tomando pasos para mitigar dichas limitantes. El trabajo en el modelo extendido de datos es el primer paso en el Atlas para expandir los tipos de datos disponibles. Para el Atlas, el sistema de eventos está transicionando de prueba piloto a un sistema en producción. En este momento ya respalda el desarrollo del nuevo portal Australian Seed Bank. Para Hedif, este trabajo informará el desarrollo futuro del modelo de datos diversificado. Para finalizar, quiero agradecer al equipo que ha hecho posible el trabajo que acabo de presentar. Gracias. Thank you, Javier. Are there any questions uh, in the room that people would like to ask? If so, please come up to the microphone. Okay, we don't see any questions in the chat. So I guess if no one has any questions, we can go ahead and get set up for the next talk. Um, 
This is going to be Pieter Hoibrek. Uh, so, yep, he can help you get set up. Testing, testing. Hi. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a little uh, bit of modeling I did about how much biodiversity is represented in preserved collections. Uh, a tale of aggregated occurrence data on GBIF. First, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my co-authors and really too many people to name, as well as Mice Botanic Garden and Disco Flanders, who paid me to do this. Uh, GBIF for providing me data and access to their Spark node on the Microsoft Planetary Computer. I also used resources from Galaxy Europe and Elixir. <clears throat> I'm going to start with the take-home message. And what I really want you to remember is that uh, big data infrastructure is really useful in our field, and it's not nearly as complicated or difficult to use as you may think. I'm trying to convince you by telling you what I did. <laughs> so in biodiversity informatics, we do have big data. Let's get that out of the way. There is a lot of it. It's very varied. It's constantly changing, and it's much easier to access than you may think. You can access it through APIs. GBIF publishes a monthly dump as a parquet file. You can run it locally or in the cloud. I tried both. I ended up using a local instance. It's easier to set up, but less powerful. Uh, <clears throat> so talking about specimens, there are a lot of specimens in the world, and only around 200 million of them have made it to GBIF. This sounds like a lot. It is a lot, but it's not nearly representative of the whole set. They publish it to Amazon uh, S3 storage. And that's where I've been getting it. <laughs> Our a naive assumption about uh, GBIF and about taxonomy in general would be that for every taxon, and when I say taxon, I actually mean taxon ID or uh, species key, if you like, so not the string, but the thing, that there would be a type because that's how it was described, right? And if the type exists, then there should be a specimen for the type. And that's the specimen you'd expect to find on GBIF, hopefully at least. But of course, not all collections are completely digitized. And a lot of them use different taxonomies. And that's difficult to work with. Uh, so I decided to just use the GBIF taxonomic backbone and offload all that work on somebody else. That's going to be a general theme. <laughs> um, what I want you to remember is that it's not trivial to estimate the number of taxa in a collection, but we can do it. Uh, so I used, made two models. Uh, I'm not going to go into their work. Uh, we don't have time, but do talk to me later. And I evaluated them. They work pretty well. What I did is I uh, took around 4,500 collection data sets from GBIF. For every one of them, I took a subset, like 20%, 75%, 10% of them, did that a bunch of times, and tried to extrapolate from that subset of the complete set to see if I could reach the number of species in the complete set. In mathematical terms, I'm trying to estimate the number of classes in a set. Um, here's an example. Oh, yeah, I should mention my model is wrong. All models are wrong. This one's just mine. Um, Here's an example of one of these sets. So I have a lot of these uh, figures, by the way. Uh, and as you can see, uh, 
if you subsample to around 20%, it does work reasonably well. I tend to underestimate, but that's fine. We don't really mind. Um, what we do need to conclude early on is that there is such a small set of the complete diversity of specimens on GBIF that it's inevitable that it will not provide global coverage. So my model or any model really starts from the data that goes into it. Uh, I can't build on what I don't know. So I'm always trying to extrapolate from the patterns that are inherent to GBIF, not from the patterns that in inherent to reality. Uh, so I'll, now I'll show some codes just to demonstrate that it's not nearly as intimidating as you think. The, the big thing in modeling exercises, often it's not actually running the model, it's getting the data in. Uh, so what I've been doing is you just take all occurrence records of GBIF, you filter those down to preserved specimen, I don't really care about machine observations or human observations. Then I join them with a taxon table to get taxonomical information, filter it down to, in this case, vascular plants, only once accepted species, so nothing, there's too much discussion about and only exactly species rank, nothing higher or lower. Then uh, I group them, tally them, basically count them. So I get like a huge array of numbers, like I have this many specimens of this species, et cetera, et cetera. And that goes into the model and that gives me a result. In this case, I estimate around 380,000 species for vascular plants. And that's in line with, uh, with established literature. However, in the backbone, there's 448,000, which is more. So we cover around 86%. Uh, I need to speed up. So the backbone, it's too big and it's too little. There's, uh, as we saw earlier, there's uh, strings that don't match the backbone. So there's valid species you can push to the backbone, don't get a key. And there's also way more accepted species in the backbone than you at once. Here's demonstration for vascular plants, but this carries over to other phyla as well. Here's a graph for the orders of vascular plants. As you can see, it's mostly yellowish green. This means that we have good coverage. Uh, you can also see a long tail, so you don't have a lot of species in every order. Let's go to a more generalist view. This is for orders over the all of taxonomy. As you can tell, Coleoptera, very blue. This means that I am expecting way more species than there are actually in the backbone. And this is also the same as Joe Waller found. If you scan that QR code real quick, you can look up your favorite order. Uh, too slow. This is uh, a view for continental. So you can add, actually keep adding layers. And this is something where Spark really shines. You don't actually need to keep all this stuff in memory. You only use what you need. So now I'm adding I have all occurrences. I add all the taxonomy to it. Now I'm adding metadata from all the publishers, because this is where the, the, the specimen is housed, not where it's from. And uh, from this metadata from the collections, I get a country code. I'm looking that up in a table to see the continent. And I can tell most uh, biodiversity is actually housed in Europe and the model agrees, Europe and North America. Now, however, this doesn't mean that this biodiversity or these specimens don't exist. This just means that the pattern that's in GBIF now doesn't expect them to be there. And this is something you need to keep in mind for the next slide, because you can go even further. You can nest it one layer up and we can see what would happen if instead of putting all this effort and keep digitizing our very well established North, uh, your American or European collections, what if we put half of that effort in another continent? Say we, instead of only doing our own stuff, we would put half the money to Africa, for example. Would that help? Would we get more done? In this case, no, uh, the model doesn't think so. The model thinks we're not in a point of uh, diminishing returns for Europe and North America. If you're in a situation where your collection is in Africa, the model thinks you should actually collaborate with North uh, America or Europe. However, what this actually demonstrates is that there is a considerable data gap for these continents. The data from Asia and from Africa may, may or may not exist, but what it actually tells you is that it's not making it to GBIF. We are making an estimate of the data gap. I'm not actually telling you what's in the data gap. I can't tell you what I don't know, just how much we don't know. Um, that's a very big nuance and that's not unique to my model <laughs> anyway. So what could all this infrastructure do for you? As you've seen, 
I can add a lot of nesting to these models and still run it locally. We are talking for that last graph, millions and millions and millions of records and very, very, very many fields. And we can run all of that out of uh, memory. You don't need to load it into RAM. You don't even need to store it locally. You can just run it somewhere else. You can leave the data at GBIF or you can leave the data at Amazon and only request what you need. Uh, it's relatively easy. You can, if you know the plier or if you know Pandas or if you know a bit of SQL, you can probably already do it. You don't need to know all this fancy Hadoop and MapReduce stuff. Spark will handle it for you. And it, I hope this will empower you to try to do things that you wouldn't have tried before. We are stepping outside of an era where ecologists need to complain about not having enough data, but we need to start using the data that's already there. And I hope that that has managed to convince you to give it a go. Thank you. All right. If anyone has some questions they'd like to ask Peter, come on up to the microphone, please. Hi, that was quite fascinating analysis. Um, how long are we talking about computational time? You said you do it, did it on your own machine. Is it run it overnight or is it within a minute or? Uh, so there's, so I'm using two different models, right? And there's the wrangling step as well. So let's separate those out. One of the models is slow and one of them is fast. The fast one can run the whole of collection space in around 15 to 20 minutes on the development server that we have, which is much more powerful than a laptop but not much more powerful than a very strong workstation. So uh, don't have too high expectations. Now the wrangling step actually goes really quick because it only requests the data that you're using at the time. Um, so depending on which route you're taking, it takes anywhere from uh, half an hour to 12 hours. And if you were to run it on something like GBIF Databricks, it would go way faster. So on the Microsoft Planetary Computer. Vince Smith, NHM. Um, fascinating data set. Really, really interesting. There is a paper in review in science that tries to get at some of this data the other way by looking at high-level assessments of collections. They're very broad bounding boxes, but I wonder if it's possible to take combine that modeling approach that you've got with that data of those sort of bounding boxes of the size of collections to try to refine and improve the model. That might be a way of maybe getting even more or getting better refined data on this issue about how big collections are and how much we need to digitize within those groups. Do you think that's possible to add those sort of constraints to the model? Uh, probably. It would be very interesting to have a closer look at it. Yeah, I agree. Are there any questions online, maybe? Um, we're not seeing any so far in the Slack or in the chat. I have a quick one, Peter. Hi, this is Debbie. Would you be willing, are you on, I don't know where this space exists for you on Slack or whatever, but if other people would like to try it or see a little live demo or um, where would that happen in the future? Where would you be willing to talk to people? Uh, we, I can definitely try to demonstrate it. Half an hour is pretty long to wait, but we can we can run some subsets. I mean, anytime from yeah. here out, not not just here at the sure, conference. Sure, get in touch. We'll arrange something. Yeah. So don't be shy. I'm just saying, Peter's fun to work with. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, and I think we'll go ahead and transition into the next talk. Um, the next talk is Chan Chan Gu, who's going to, uh, I will let her um, announce her own title. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Are we okay? Uh, hello. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Wait. So wait, it's one for the maps. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Where is that? Right. Hi. Um. Basically, today I'm talking about the uh, how to enhance knowledge graph, um, uh, with machine learning things, but the one is actually this one is actually really pure machine learning research, but I will not actually go into any linear algebra details behind. So if you actually have any math questions, those just stay after. For people who have no idea about what exactly a knowledge graph like defined in machine learning, I just rephrase it a bit. So uh, the knowledge graph like, is kind of like the structure models, like we can actually do uh, embeddings of things in machine learning. So basically a data structure. So every data structure can be read in machine learning model. And the reason why we started this research is we found that knowledge graph can actually have kind of like quite a lot of benefits to data workflow for um, data ag uh, aggregations, digitization, and also transitions. And we start from the knowledge graph and try to take adventures after it. And generally, a knowledge graph is actually be initialized by either a creation system or literature, and or maybe open source like GB or uh, Harvard's libraries and things. But after like we obtain a knowledge graph, that we can do a, play a little bit tricks on it to perform a data aggregation and quality controls. One thing is actually in machine learning, knowledge graph can actually help to support data completion. So, and also like filling the missing data that um, probably that you actually don't actually have in your database, but actually have in other database. So um, it's actually a data aggregation model. So it's providing kind of like suggestions. So for example, in our NXM, we have kind of like a herbarium collection that's like probably keys actually have the same same collection, but we actually holding different like um, data like um for example the baby our one actually have the locality but their one still doesn't so on our knowledge graph model should able to actually fill in this gap and another thing that a knowledge graph can do is actually kind of like to a post correction for OCR so OCR is optical character recognitions which my colleagues performed for Ariana's like Alice work and Another thing is, is after we actually have uh, data aggregation models, we should be able to identify the gaps between uh, the spatial provinces also for speeding up a digitization process. And after we speed up the digitization process and we all got the transcriptions verified it, it will actually become another data source things that actually be, we can use for updating the knowledge graph. Another thing is actually this process is not only a crop bias, but it's actually anti-crop bias. So it's actually a reinforcement learning process. So starting from the same point, if we actually have a trained machine learning data, uh, knowledge graph um, models, like work it well structured and like it's promising and convincing both like for the models, it actually can be able to uh, interact with the human in the, in the loop interactions, like for example, a recommendation system. So let's try to suggest vocabulary or dictionary that or portfolio that can actually help the transcriptor to accelerate that. Um, their works. Another thing is actually, um, it actually can provide kind of like a verifications and correction for the digitization process. Also, it can have like generate more um, accurate or maybe more um, 
convincing data set like for the data aggregation model and also if the accuracy and the model perform quite well and we will possibly have uh, um digitizations and knowledge graph like um unsupervised learning model so what it means for unsupervised, it means um, the data can actually go for the digitization pipeline and it can be automatically uh, corrected and verified by the knowledge crowd without any human interaction. This is a, um, this is one of the aim that we are looking for, but we kind of like still have a few steps to it. And the last bit is actually, if we have a really good data set. So it's actually the data aggregations and the, a really good quality control the data. And we can use this kind of like um, data set to actually do a knowledge graph alignment and also identify kind of like the relevant importances and determine the ways. So what is mean by the determine the ways is actually um, try to kind of like redefine our knowledge graph structure. So what we can do, like how we can do it. And it's actually, we are introduced our the machine learning model we are using currently behind is actually the graph neural network. Uh, basically you can think it's actually an encoder and it's kind of like try to uh, have a transformations from all the attributes to a uh, symmetric representation in math. And what we are using here is the relational knowledge, uh, graph convolution network. So convolution networks is uh, really is like um, a way to try to describe a data. So for the RCNs, basically we have two major property. One is the entity, one is the link. So entities is basically the nodes. So for example, that the category showing in the image, um, is it can be either the collector names or maybe the locality or maybe the georeferencing data. So everything that with the category can be the entity. And the link is really simple. It's actually the relationship between them. And respectively, um, for our model, we have two aims to these basic things. So one is actually the entity classification. So our model should be able to actually recognize what exactly the, this piece of input information should be categorizing it. So this is the first aim. And the second aim is actually the link prediction. So the, the, our model can actually um, predict a link between two different entities. And this is the key to actually do kind of like the uh, data ag aggregation model. So it's kind of like suggesting uh, the, the vocabulary and also like filling the missing data gap. So here's some math. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm actually not going to go with the detail here. So uh, here is actually showing like we actually define a graph model with the V is actually our entity, the epsilon is actually the relationship, and R is actually the relation type. Oops, sorry. Um, we have tested a bit um, with two different like uh, set of scenario. One is actually the regularization. Uh, regularization. So it, this one is actually how you actually try to use different ways to define the relationship between different entities. And the next one is a features representation. What is feature representation? So it's actually a way how you actually try to transcribe your data. So we have basics decompositions for the first weight uh, of defined one function. And then the second one is actually the Brock diagnosis. What's the difference between? The first one is basically that you got actually got a set of share functions. So your graph will basically share the features for all the relationships. But the Brock diagnose is actually you define individual matrix for every relationship. So the one whole vector is like simply do a linear transform, but the, the back of words, you tr probably try to contact different features for the vector for, uh, for identify the entity vector. So now we go to the, 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 final, the final bit is actually the result. And um, we have our model have already achieved 88% accuracy on the entity classification and 66 MR, so percent of MR of the link prediction. Um, 
here is actually uh, the graph that's showing is actually uh, we tried like for basics uh, for different size parameter running and fine tuning it. So you can see that the highest is actually nearly 67. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's 67 for the main uh, respiratory rank. And the last slide that is actually about the loss function. This is actually showing the training loss like for our machine learning model. You probably will have a questions why that we actually have those kind of pick. And this leads to a final question said to the community is actually sometimes like when we actually try to have the share um share functions like for the, all the relations we always have outliners in our data set for example is um for the hibarium sheets like that we don't actually have all the um sorry all the locality so probably that it will we will need to think about whether we need to have completeness or high performance where we want, really want to consider to count this kind of outliners within the models or not. And thanks, everything. And if you actually have anything I uh, deep, want to ask in detail, please go to our AI and for natural science conference. In, on, it will be on the 3rd of November. And that's everything. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for overrun a bit. All right. Thank you. We have we have some time for questions. If anyone wants to uh, come, uh, I think they want us to use this microphone here. Hello. Hi. Hi. So super interesting uh, as someone who's played with this for a while. Um, and uh, so I'm interested in, you know, these neural networks and the difference between that and true reasoning across that graph in order to understand gaps and, and try to fill in things. What can you just give us a simple why this and not that? What's the difference? Um, so your question is asking me why only using this model? Yes. That's right. Or have you compared it or, you know, between true reasoning and... Okay, so the re uh, first reason why we want to use the GCN is basically that um, GCN is perfectly designed for graph data. So it's like, uh, the knowledge graph is basically a graph data. And another thing is actually for um, the... Um, the reason why we promote the relation is here is because a general GCN is only considering a connectivity the between two different like uh, the entities. So it's more uh, more concentrating on how to learn the uh, representation or the transformation of the entity itself, but not actually providing a really good way to. Um, predict the link between and for our cases is what we aim more focusing on is not only actually uh, find a representation for the graph data but also try to um, actually to make it ex the graph can be expanded and grow it and the reason why that we suggested one is actually I mentioned this like in the for the decomposition uh, method we will have a couple of them and one of is actually broke diagnosis it which like it doesn't actually provide a really promising result as the basis but why we keep it here is actually it means Every time you actually add an additional relationship to your graph, you can actually simply add an extra layer like of matrix in your weight function. So it can be more provide more possibility and flexibility for expanding the graph in the future. Because uh, we know that say like, um, for different institute or different hibernum corrections on things, we probably have different relationship. But sometimes at a point, we want to actually link all the data together. So we kind of like living a leverage that we can actually improve it in the future if we actually find a better representation of it, so it can be growth. So this is simply the answer. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think 
we need to transition to the next talk. So uh, Richard Levy is going to be next. All right, hi, I'm Rick from Denver Botanic Gardens and Today I'm going to tell you about um, a little app I made called Specimods, and it's for making files for submitting to GenBank. First, a little background. So in North America, the known fungal diversity is dwarfed by the expected diversity, which is probably true everywhere. However, we have this unique situation where um, the taxonomy is borrowed and um, pretty much completely based on European descriptions of macrofungi. Um, so we actually don't even know what we have, kind of, period. Um, so the Fungal Diversity Survey is an organization that was formed to provide funding for projects that are documenting uh, macrofungi in North America through vouchering and sequencing. And as part of that is the Colorado Macrofungi Project, which is based out of Denver Botanic Gardens and led by uh, Dr. Andrew Wilson, who's shown here with uh, a previous graduate student, Gary Olds. And together they developed a workflow for mass sequencing macrofungal specimens from uh, our museum collection and, and other collections. But, well, the, the gist is they would subsample a specimen, get the DNA and then run the sequence, but they were hitting this bottleneck when it came to actually submitting the sequences to NCBI's uh, GenBank database. And they needed the two files, the fastest sequence file and the source modifier file. And this is taking them way too much time. Um, oh, so the, in case you're not familiar, FASTA file just, contains like a, the sequence, the temporary sequence ID, um, a little description, and then the following line is the nucleotide sequence itself. And then the source modifier file is basically all of the metadata describing the uh, source of the DNA. So in our case, it was the mu museum specimen metadata. And it looks like this, just a tab separated text file. So I found that Andy was actually querying the data from GBIF and then manually matching it up with the sequences and creating the files himself, which was using all of his limited, or at that point, limited brain power plus a ton of time. And so I just wrote him a little Python script that would do it for him. It was still taking just the data that we had downloaded from GBIF and linking it up with uh, the sequences and then did most of the formatting. So it was saving us some time, but we knew that we were going to be doing this probably tens of thousands more times across hopefully half a dozen or so more graduate students going forward. So I made a little website that did for us and it's called Specimods. And um, basically anyone can use it. You just sign up with an email and it allows you to take a CSV of whatever sequences um, you have. And if you add a specimen identifier and this case, it's just the catalog number and the collection code. You upload it and then you can download your files. So, um, and like I said, it, it just allows the a user to have a, basically a list of their sequences in a SQL database. So you can only access your own sequences, what you upload. So here's how it works. The user can download a CSV template, populate it with their sequences and uh, specimen catalog numbers, and then upload it. They then they can then prompt the GBIF API to pull all of the specimen metadata into the database. And then voila, it's all there. You hit generate the files. Oh, you select the, spe you select the sequences you want. Then you hit generate the files and they can be downloaded. And here's what the output looks like. Um, it, you, the user will supply like a temporary sequence ID, um, but then the rest is, taken over by the uh, by the app so it gives it pulls the genus and species name for the organism modifier and then it creates this definition line um, with a 
and, and in my case, for the example, just a randomly generated sequence is kind of the description. Um, and it yeah does this for all the sequences you select, and then it spits out the source modifier table with perfectly formatted um, uh, data. So this was this was something that we ran into a lot where uh, the G, the GenBank data didn't necessarily match up with Darwin Core. So you can see country is actually means the entire locality string. So that was slowing a lot of folks down. Um, and this just does it for you. So does it work? Uh, well, we've submitted about 600, um, just over 600 sequences to GenBank using this. And anecdotally, um, Andy was telling me that in his previous experience, it would take sometimes more than a week to get the GenBank uh, accession numbers back and typically things were getting flagged by their indexers a lot. But after he started using this, he was just within a day getting the, uh, getting the accession numbers and everything was going through nice and easy. So I've managed to, to make at least one person happy. Um, and what's next is we initially developed this um, just for just for the barcoding of macrofungal specimens and you know the taxonomic uh, or the ge genetic taxonomy there. So I might go ahead and make this so a little bit more applicable to different uh, different groups and allow users to essentially define their own sequence types. And then I'd also like to figure out a way to cite the data that I'm getting from the GBIF API. So if anyone knows how I can do that, if it's possible, um, that would be great. And with that, I'd like to thank all these nice people and organizations and Tadwig. And there's a little QR code to the site if you're curious. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And we have uh, plenty of time for questions, um, either in the chat or you can come up if you want to ask a question. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> So I'm just curious, um, the same kind of question I asked Peter, how do we find each other after the meeting for those of us who might be interested? I know, um, did Mike Trisna, right? Did he build something similar? Don't think it works the same way as yours. I am not sure. I can't remember exactly, but it was something okay. about GenBank accession numbers finding, is it here and is it there? It was kind of checking back and forth. Do you have, you know, sequences for what for which I have specimens, or do you have specimens for which I have sequence data checker? I'm just curious. That sounds interesting. You cool. said Mike? Mike Trisna okay. at the Smithsonian. Okay. Cool. All right. Anybody <laughs> else built something similar? How do you find it? Yes, James? <laughs> Well, our, ours is simply internalized inside the system that we enforce for these big projects where they put their data. So, of course, one of the hassles is publishing stuff to NCBI, right? Mm -hmm. And the trouble with Darwin Core not aligning exactly to it and making those concessions. <laughs> so, anyway, you have no choice there, right? But the circle back is easy because in our case, we're not really going to look for it. We're publishing at the same time mm -hmm. or we know the identifiers already match. So we nice. don't have that problem, but we've at least internalized and made it easy for researchers to just push the magic button if, if their data is formed correctly, which it kind of is enforced to be within the system. I think a lot of us definitely are in exactly this boat. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So if there are no other questions in the room, I guess we can go ahead and transition. The next talk is gonna be a recorded presentation. So it may take us a moment to get that set up.
Yeah, there are links that are in the Slack now for Rick's talk if you want to check out the Slack. Should we start? Hello, my name is Kesia Barenko, and I work at the University of Tartu Natural History Museum. My presentation today will be about the unit species hypothesis matching analysis. So there are more than two million species uh, described by science to date, while the estimated conservative number of species currently living on Earth is uh, 15 million. It means that uh, most of the species are not yet officially described and they lack scientific names. Uh, this makes uh, scientific communication without the unique taxon names very difficult. Unique names allow people to describe uh, which uh, species were studied, databased, detected, and so on. And uh, this has become a serious problem with the uh, rapid development of uh, new methods, uh, molecular methods today, uh, which makes it possible to discover these undescribed uh, species or uh, dark taxa, as they are often referred to from different environmental samples. And to be able to communicate these uh, undescribed species detected from eDNA samples, but to also improve uh, data for already described species, we have developed a theoretical and uh, practical platform called the UNITE for calculating and uh, communicating DNA based uh, species that may not have been described as formal species yet. Uh, the UNITE uh, develops curated uh, uh, ribosomal DNA ITS datasets, uh, the official barcode for fungi, uh, originating from many biological sample of tissue, for example, voucher specimen, living specimen, soil sample, and so on. And these uh, DNA barcode sequences uh, are connected to the type specimen data locality, habitat, traits, and multimedia. Uh, UNITE uh, also supports online bio-curation and uh, third-party annotation of uh, INSD sequences through its uh, data management uh, platform uh, called uh, BlueTF. And also boosting these annotations to European Nucleotide Archive through the Elixir, Elixir Contextual Data Clearing House, UPI. And the uh, UNITE community also calculates and manages uh, DNA-based uh, species hypothesis and their communication through stable digital object identifiers. And more information about the UNITE species hypothesis and their application can be found from the articles published in uh, Science and uh, more recently in Microorganisms. Uh, four years ago, the UNITE species hypothesis were also included in uh, GBIF uh, backbone classification as the first uh, so-called OTU-based uh, classification there. Uh, so the UNITE uh, species hypothesis matching tool I'm presenting here today is a digital service for the global species discovery from environmental DNA. It is based on the UNITE uh, species hypothesis datasets and is very useful for understanding uh, species distribution patterns, host range, and so on. And also to answer questions like, uh, are these potentially undescribed new species, where they are found in other studies, are they alien or threatened species, and so on. And the tool places your unknown DNA sequences into existing UNITE uh, species hypothesis and gives information about uh, the species hypothesis missing from the system, helping users to discover undescribed species new to the science. And the output will provide the DNA-based uh, stable identifiers for communicating species hypothesis found in your eDNA dataset. So how it works, 
users uh, come with their DNA sequence data set, typically a FOSTA file, and uh, analyze their data using a Unite SH matching service, either by installing it in their own computer or uh, high performance computer cluster, or by running it uh, online on a Bluetooth platform. And uh, they retrieve analysis results a series of uh, CSV and HTML files showing uh, whether their DNA sequences are placed into existing species hypotheses or forming new ones. And they also get uh, statistics about how many potentially new species hypotheses there are in their data set, direct uh, links to SHS and a Krona chart for interactive visualization of uh, the taxonomic units for which there is taxonomic information available. And in the case of uh, existing species hypothesis, users can browse the SH on UNITE homepage or by opening a DOI view. Uh, the SH page uh, shows the uh, species hypothesis taxonomy information linked to the respective DOI page list of uh, individuals, the DNA sequences, and their metadata included in species hypothesis, uh, distribution map, and some statistics about the uh, species hypothesis. And to complement uh, the SH system and the underlying data sets, especially in the case of uh, uh, species hypothesis uh, new to the system, uh, users are encouraged uh, to submit their uh, DNA sequences and metadata to UNITE so that uh, the data could be incorporated into the system and made available to other users. Mm, the latest release of uh, UNITE species hypothesis includes uh, more than uh, 8 million eukaryote RDNA IT sequences with more than 7 million originating from uh, uh, approximately 4,500 eDNA samples, and uh, more than 8,000 are from uh, sequenced type material. Uh, if the input uh, data is uploaded to Bluetooth platform, users can uh, publish uh, their uh, dataset and analysis results in GBIF as uh, DNA-derived occurrence data, uh, where their uh, records will be provided with uh, SH identifiers connected to species, species hypothesis in uh, GBIF uh, backbone classification, and uh, finally linked to other datasets in GBIF where records have been provided with uh, SH-based identifications. And uh, here is an example view page of one uh, SH identified on a class level, Agaricum Mitsetes SP, uh, which appears in two uh, distinct uh, uh, occurrence data sets, one study from Norway and another from Denmark, with a total of 11 occurrences. So the SH matching analysis tool is available online through the Bluetooth uh, platform or for downloading as a standalone version in uh, GitHub. And the uh, SH uh, reference datasets for DNA-based molecular identification are provided in different formats. The most uh, widely used listed here, the key model, Crest due time and uh, also general FASTA release. And uh, hereby I'm finishing my presentation with uh, acknowledgements to my co authors and co workers. And uh, thank you all for listening. So, oops. Hello. 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 This one. Hello. Hello. Okay. 
Um, so Cassie is online and uh, she said she'd be available to take questions live. So if anyone wants to ask a question, if I can get the right microphone turned on, you can come and ask her a question. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So we are actually quite a bit ahead of schedule. And um, if anyone has a question for Kessie, you can still uh, ask it. Um, but also a question, um, Xian Xian, are you still here somewhere? Yeah, um, there was a question in the chat and we have we're like, a number of minutes ahead of schedule. Um, do you want to, would you mind answering a question? Uh, come on up. Yeah, so, uh, well, actually, David, do you want to just ask your question to her directly <laughs> since you're in the room? Actually, I'm trying to reply to you. <laughs> oh, you're, okay. Yeah, I'm typing. Yeah, so my question, uh, first of all, hi, I'm David Fischmuller from Botanic Garden Berlin. Um, my question was in regard to the training, um, and you mentioned in that well, your model is not perfect, and it's like uh, you get outliers and and uh, occasional problems. Um, so, what would help you more in regards of improving your model and tr uh, training it? Would it be that you get like a little but really high quality data through professional curators, or just a lot of data with like lit lower quality levels in terms of getting data through citizen science projects and crowdsourcing in general? Which of those would help you more? Mm -hmm. Actually, the first one, the high quality like data, is um, there are a couple of reasons with it. Because like the first one, and actually, if uh, even though it's like machine learning, we all know it's like uh, in statistical analysis, we say that like, if you actually have any problem with your machine learning model, it will probably that because your data is not large enough. But this is not exactly correct for machine learning side process because um what even though you probably have a really large number of data, that it might be a cases that the data is not actually in balance because we actually have a categorizing process within our model. So if actually the data is not really that in ba uh, that balanced, it will actually have more cases that the outliers actually will not actually be counted perfectly or like uh, carrying into the, our actual relationships, like um, like our refinery process. So um, the numbers is important, but the quality is more important in our project. Is can have I answered a question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I guess we can, um, let's go ahead and uh, transition into our last talk. Uh, Donat Agusti is going to talk. And um, we are ahead of schedule. So if you will answer, uh, ask questions for that talk. But if you have any talk for any of the previous um, presenters, we can uh, discuss a little bit at the end or just leave early for coffee. So be thinking if you have any other questions. You can hear me, yes.
Now we're losing all the time we want. So. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think I just say good morning to everybody and thank you again for having a chance to talk to you. Um, you see, my <clears throat> presentation or our better our presentation two days ago about uh, treatment bank and and uh, thank you treatment bank and the biodiversity literature repository. Today I will talk to, together with Laura Spanishu. Lubo and Roger Hyam about uh, a workflow from to to the world for online, and we hoped we could actually demonstrate something today, but we are not yet there. We have to wait to the next solis this that this is hopefully going to happen. But we also found out in the meantime that it's not important to have one-to-one -one relationships which are individual but try to find that create relationships that are generic so what you see now is more a generic solution how you actually could import public uh, data from publications into GBIF. so that's what i showed the slide last uh last days in a nutshell the data comes as publications goes to treatment bank factory and shows up in GBIF and shows up in checklist bank the data on the on the left hand are publications. They are unstructured data, essentially unstructured, uh, in the sense that their name is in, but they are not tagged. Then we can extract taxonomic names, material citations, treatments, figures, as our core objects. We can look at that from an operational and an institutional point of view, and I think that's a very important issue because talking to institutions to to work in this this environment is important, probably the more limiting factor than actually the, the technology behind. Or you can look at that from the data point of view. So you have publication and they, uh, you import this data into the other side. Our workflow, a bit more in detail, is we get PDFs, we convert them into the Imagine um, file. That's a file format we created, which is is uh, open, which is based on 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 uh, CSVs which allows essentially any time to look at the data. From that, we import this into the treatment bank uh, server from where we package the respective data into Darby Core archives and we ship this to, to GBIF and GBIF just takes the, the, the Darby Core archive apart and puts data to use uh, both in GBIF and now also in Checklist Bank. So I will talk only about the essentially the transfer of the Darwin Core archive. <clears throat> in our system, we use, uh, you assign identifiers for the treatment, that's a UID, an internal UID, but you see will also be used afterwards. The taxonomic name in the nomenclature section, that's assigned the label of the treatment, becomes a, a UID plus a taxon, so that's also its ID. And material citations become a combined uh, identifier, which is the oops, pardon, which is the um, the, tre the the treatment ID plus a unique ID for a material citation. So this way we can always identify any elements. Then we package this in Darwin Core archives. And I, I guess most of you are now familiar with that. So it has a a meta. It is, it's a series of of text files, which will not show me here. It has a series of text files which uh, include a, a, a list of of all the the files which are included there. It has a text file which includes the taxonomic information, another one for for the occurrences, and a meta file which includes all the the actual treatment and in HTML format, and it includes. Well, <laughs> Tell me back.
So now I have to speak not slow, but very fast to pick up on the, the time I'm losing because of the no show here. Yeah. Anyway, so who who is a, who knows the Darwin Core archive structure? So we don't need to explain that. That's actually very good. So we have seen them. So what I'm going to show, if it shows up, is essentially how we convert a taxonomic name into the Darwin Core archive, the, the, the taxon text file in the Darwin Core archive, and also the 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 holotype into into the the, um, the occurrence text file this then will be picked up on on shows up on on um, on on on, uh, on on checklist bank but we can also go go ahead and say okay here we have a synonymy in this this uh, treatment so this treatment actually synonymizes or cites a synonym so we show we will show there's a possibility in the in the darwin in the in the the text on text file to to formalize the synonymy. So essentially, it says, okay, this name is actually this has this original this this current accepted name, and it's a, and it has a synonym included. So this is all possible through the current uh, through the current uh, Darwin Core archive. There are limitations to that. For example, when you create a new species based on an existing species. It, that means if part of a an existing tex, taxon is broken off and becomes a new species. So right now there's no way that we can we can uh, model that in 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 in, uh, in the taxon in the taxon file. So this is like an interesting challenge. Now we hopefully we can discuss here and 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 start discussing it here because it probably needs some more tweaking and, and understanding how to actually make it sure. That when there is a, a synonymy or a new species created based on existing species, how does it show up at, at the end in checklist bank? And how can you automate this part? So what I would then would show you, explain how do we get this data into GBIF? So this is a process that that treatment bank creates a, a call uh, to, to GBIF and gets a set key back. Once we have the set key, we then tell uh, GBIF, okay, here we have a new data set, new Darwin Core archive, and GBIF picks it up and, and, and includes this uh, data set. Once the data set is updated on our side, we send another call to, to GBIF and say, hey, we have a new updated version of this Darwin Core archive, and GBIF uh, then uh, gets this or fetches this Darwin, new Darwin Core archive. This process is sort of real time, so we we process our the data on our end, and we seen about seven minutes. That means there's some latency here. So in case somebody makes a change, it goes to GBIF and it shows up. We seen GBIF if it's a new data set now, it shows more or less immediately up also in checklist bank. If if it's an existing, it takes about a week to to update. The data is not just accessible this way. The data can also be obtained through different APIs we have at Plotsy. So you would see a list now and explain you what kind of data you can get. You can get two kinds of data in Plotsy on treatment bank. You can get the entire data about the entire article, and you can get mainly data about treatments. And because of copyright, in many in most cases, we cannot give you access to the data in in for all the articles because it's it's copyrighted but what we can do we can provide the darwin core archive for an entire article which includes all the treatments all the figures and links to figures and and bibliographic references which is an excerpt of the, the original publication we can access provide access to you in various formats to to the treatment data however you can query it there are there's there are apis there's the plots stats we have a all the data in an XML re repo on GitHub. And there's also an, an, uh, an LOD version, ex ex RDF version accessible. This is the, the, the LOD version is made to represent uh, name relationships. So essentially, it allows you to actually then use taxonomic names in a linked open data world. 
Um, so what we were interested in is how, what is you as consumer of this data? What is your interest? So what would you need as a cataloger or a nomenclature in terms of data? And what kind of data quality do you want? So that's a, a number of, of granularity and it's, it's also data quality and format. It's finished now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now we have some illustrations. You can recapitulate. So this is a new species. Here is the quickly the you see the, the taxon ID that were mentioned before. There's nomenclature status, so you know it's a new species. Here is the, the occurrence, the occurrence file. Here is the, 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 the occurrence ID. And it says it's type of status holotypes. Essentially, we know, okay, this is link is made between a new species and, and the holotype. If you do like here a synonym, like in this case, there is a synonym on, 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 uh, on, on checklist bank, then it's listed like this. So you have like a label taxonomic status, a synonym, and it says what name is linked to what name. So essentially, you see the, this is the, 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 the taxon name of the treatment, and this is a taxon name, but in the treatment citation, which has a synonym dot syn extension. So we know this is a synonymy where it's been cited by in, within this treatment. There's a treatment citation, in other words. So this is, we talked about this. This is the very rich access point. To, it's a bit confusing. You need some sort of work, but you can get almost all the data out from, from, from treatment bank. And essentially, it's an also encouragement for you. <laughs> I would explore that because you see that you can open all of that. You can find out how many words are, are used, for example, in a treatment. So there you can do a lot of all different interesting stuff. So this is access to 750,000 treatments right now. Then there are article level access. That's the, as I mentioned, you can get this in, in, in uh, biodiversity literature repository. You can get this also in JSON format, which is very rich data. So, and, and it's important because it, it complements an article because this, this way you have all the metadata of an article. Metadata means you have essentially a list of what's in a, a publication. You have all the, the treatments listed and, and link. You have access to all the figures and so on. So if you want to search and find out what's in a publication, that's maybe one way to go. And here is the list of all the APIs and access points. So you can look at the, the uh, the, um, the the presentation once it's online. And then these are the questions I already asked you, so we can discuss and you should come. And here is Laurence Benichus is there, so she can go ask her. She's one of the editors of the, on the CETAF, CETAF publishing group. So she is interested to know what you could do and also how one has to structure publications better so this workflow wor works more more eff efficiently than Theodore and, and Lubo, everybody knows. Guido, I'm not sure whether he is around. He's our, our computer guy. He's also in the corridors. And go talk to us. We're interested in a way to improve the system. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you deserves special recognition for uh, dealing with difficult circumstances. Thanks. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, so we have uh, over five minutes left for um, questions. So we'll start if uh, anyone has questions for Donut, uh, please come up and use this microphone. Hi, Peter Smith from Imbo, Belgium. Um, Marcus During and Olaf Penke uh, presented the uh, checklist bank on Tuesday yep. and how you can directly publish to there and data from there also makes it to JBF. Has Platzi considered that approach? Are there any advantages from publishing directly to checklist bank rather than publishing to JBF? I'm asking because we're also publishing checklists and we're looking at Platzi as, a, as an example because we have more experience in publishing checklists. So we published to GB for GB publishes to Checklist Bank. And the the history is a bit more because originally we and we worked with the Encyclopedia of Life as input of all the treatment 
in the Encyclopedia of Life and then this stuff, but we use that now and she be picked up. So all the treatments, you can see them individually in, in, in uh, GBIF. And that's also why you get all the maturity occurrences as, as uh, materials, uh, as holotypes in, in Czech free Spain. No, I think it's fine because it's essentially we have one interaction, there's an interaction with uh, GBIF, and then it, it migrates from there. So it's not exactly a question to Donald, but uh, maybe uh, to be the answer on your question. The advantage is that publishing to GBIF, GBIF also published this, this data as a treatments, and they from there goes to, to checklist bank. So you have uh, two different views of this information. And I have a question probably to, to some uh, someone of, on GBIF site. Can we have a link from checklist bank to those treatment pages? Because I don't think that currently exists. Yeah, on the treatments, I can uh, I, I can give that answer. Uh, actually, the treatments are already in Checklist Bank, but they're not shown. Yeah, so at a certain moment they will be shown. And uh, to Peter, I think I think you have a very valid question that we um, I say yeah we need to come up with an answer for for that. It needs a bit more discussion probably also with GBF. Um, uh, but it's not unlikely that we end up in that situation at some point that um, uh, checklist publishing will flow through checklist bank also for GBEF. Yeah, but that that is still a long uh, way to go, I think, and uh, a lot of work that we need to to do together. Thanks. Maybe we could also make a point that right now there are 45 to 50 journals included in this workflow. So it's not just uh, an idea, but it's, it's on a daily processing. There are journals from each European Journal of Taxonomy. I think about 38 journals from, from Painsoft and on our side, we process another stack. So it's actually on a daily base, there's an update now for checklist bank and GBIF. So it's not something to Think, but it's actually interesting now to look into and, and see how we can improve this. Donald, you're talking about journals, but I wonder if you have some good use cases of entire monographs, uh, world level checklists, or flora volumes, which also can go there. Yes, there, it, it, it's not a question of of one or a hundred or thousand treatments. So we have, we wanted to show you today the flora of Cameroon. It's going up probably today at some point. So that's a, a special flora, which has been published in, in, in a phyto, phyto keys, on which we are trying to convert. But you see the issue that's a little detail why it's not yet online is that in taxonomy, we want page numbers. And in electronic publishing, you don't have page numbers. So the question is, how do you bring in a page number, which is in the PDF, into the document so we can cite this in, uh, in, in checklist bank? But we get there. You will see. We'll let you know once we have this huge monograph, this flora of Cameroon published. Or not published, but mediated and, and made accessible uh, in GBIF. And so the size is not a, the size is not a limitation. It's really it's a, like technical issues. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Donet, and also thank you to all of our other speakers and for the um, people who helped to make the session run. So I think we're all ready to have some coffee. So thanks to all the speakers. <laughs>